without further ado, I will introduce Dr. Tony Salerno and Roberto Luis Fernandez. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Tony, and I'm really very, very pleased uh, to have an opportunity to share with you uh, through my conversation with Dr. Roberto Luis Fernandez on, on a topic that really everyone is, is struggling with. And so uh, just to give you a little bit of the background of uh, Dr. Uh, Lewis, uh, he's a professor of clinical psychiatry at Columbia, uh, the College of Physicians and Surgeons, and he's the director of the New York State Center for Excellence for Cultural Competence and the Hispanic Treatment Program. He's also co-director of the Anxiety Disorders Clinic at the New York State Psychiatric Institute. He's also a lecturer on global health and social medicine at Harvard University. So Dr. Lewis' research focuses on developing clinical interventions and novel service delivery approaches to help overcome disparities in the care of underserved cultural groups. His work centers on improving treatment engagement and retention in mental health and physical health care by persons with anxiety, depression, schizophrenia, and other serious mental health problems. He also studies the way culture affects individuals, uh, experience of mental disorders and their help-seeking expectations, including how to explore the cultural variation during a psychiatric evaluation. Now, Dr. Lewis uh, really led the development of the DSM-5 cultural formulation interview that some of you may be aware of. And it's a standardized method for cultural assessment for use in mental health practice and was the principal investigator uh, of its international field trials or really around the world in Canada and India, Kenya, the Netherlands, Peru, and the United States. So it really is an honor to have Dr. Roberto Luis Fernandez with us today to help him, you know, for us to gain some insight into how we improve our practice to having a greater sensitivity and awareness around cultural factors and then some really practical ways for individuals in your practice, all of you out there who are involved in, in care of others, uh, to integrate some of those concepts into your work. So welcome, uh, Dr. Lewis. Thank you very Thank much. You appreciate it. Um, you know, we were chatting a little bit before uh, that you uh, didn't start out in medicine, right? That you started in, in uh, you know, comparative, uh, you know, religion was an area of study. But somewhere along the line, you decided that the area of cultural uh, factors in uh, mental health care uh, was going to be an important part of your life's work. Why, why is that? What, what led you to believe that that would be an area you really wanted to focus on? Well, yes, I, I was earlier in my career interested in religion in particular as a, as a field of study. And I, what attracted me to religion was the way uh, people made sense of their life. So the changing ways in which people in different communities and over time had struggled with very similar questions about death and, and meaning of life and children and suffering and, mm -hmm. and all these issues. And so I carried that idea over into something that I felt was applied to mental health struggles, which is the area of culture more generally, religion being part of it, but, but culture more generally in the sense of how people make sense of experience and practice their lives and fit in a society in certain ways, understanding all that as part of the way that we try to understand what's going on with them and try to help them. So, so it was a very practical concern as well as a Kind of intellectual. Concept. Okay, no, that's no, that's great. You know, people have had a lot, and many of the folks out here are listening. They've gone to cultural awareness and cultural sensitivity, and those sorts of issues that folks struggle with. And, uh, and sometimes it's not clear on what do we mean really by, yeah. by, by culture. What are we, what are we talking about, and why that is that so important uh, for us to be aware of in the in the work that we that we do. That's a great question, and I, I hope I don't take the whole hour no, no, uh, trying to fine. answer, but. Uh, I think I'll, I will want to make a couple points. Uh, one point is that what we mean by culture, which is a very difficult word to yeah. define, and everybody has a different understanding, and there's whole, a whole field called anthropology. All they do is debate about what culture, culture is. is. Yeah, but uh, the, the practical way, if you will, that we use the term in DSM-5 and in developing this uh, evaluation approach, the cultural formulation interview, is as a culture as the set of meaning making processes and practices that people do engage in think uh, believe act in order to make sense of the experience so in that sense everybody has a culture mm -hmm. you know as opposed to the kind of american idea that culture is minority status in some way right. so so you know if uh 
it's sort of the 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 uh, extreme version of that idea is that somehow there are people with culture and people without, without culture, kind of normal people and then <laughs> different people. Right. And uh, our uh, our approach is entirely based uh, on, on the idea that everybody has a cultural understanding. Everybody is part in, in practice. Everybody is part of a number of communities, mm -hmm. and they derive their sense of the world from their participation in those communities. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we all make it make a meaning of our own, you know, by ourselves. We all have our own sense of what meaning is in our lives, but we don't make that up out of nothing. We, we, we create meaning in our own individual existence because we've been exposed to multiple meanings throughout our life. Mm -hmm. So by virtue of being of a certain age, of a certain gender, or a certain sexual orientation, religion, language, race, ethnicity, profession, you know, any a lot, number of... A lot of identities city, there, Yes, right? yes. A lot of identities there. That's right. And, and we are the intersection of all these identities that, that we also then change ourselves. So it's a very fluid process. It changes from, you know, when you're engaging in one setting or another setting. You're, when you talk about your mental health type problems, you're not the same person, if you will, if you talk about them in church. Than if you talk about them with your psychiatrist or with your, you know, physical health doctor or with your boss, I mean, you you would talk about them differently and think of them differently because they have different aspects, and you are participating in those communities in different ways. So, so what we do with the cultural formulation interview or with the whole idea we have about culture and cultural evaluation is to try to understand that complexity of. Uh, background and experience and meaning making in order to help understand what the person thinks of the situation, how they look at it, what is it they expect, what is it they want us as providers to do, what is it they don't want us to do, what they tried before that was really counter to the way they think about it. Now I just want to add one more yeah. point, which is the second point, if you will, which won't be as long as okay. the first one. But the, the second point is that what I've said would be helpful, all this appreciation of culture in a person's life would be helpful for anybody, not just people who suffer from disparity, disparate care, unequal care. So if you're a very wealthy person with a, you know every privilege in life, it's still very useful for your providers to know how you think. So there's a person-centered element to it that transcends whether you have had equal access to care or not. At the same time, having said that, <clears throat> uh, misunderstanding of people's, uh, you know, the things that led to the illness, you know, the social determinants of health, the structure of society in which the person fits that has led them to experience certain problems that has led to the mental health uh, struggles, their own understandings and expectations of care and past experience, all that is even more important for people who haven't received good care. So it's sort of like a corrective, if you will, that is good for everybody, so right. we use it, we, we advocate its use for everybody, right. but there are certain uses of it for disparity reduction that are particularly important. Yeah. So what was the problem in our current system, uh -huh. current practices, that you were hoping to address right. with creating this resource and tool, really for, for, the, for the field, right? right. And that's what a lot of the work was. Let's create some resource, uh, some, some tool that others can use to address a prevailing problem, and, and how right. would you how would you describe that that prevailing problem? Right, there are yeah, that's also a long answer, which I will try to not <laughs> go on forever about. But, I'll try to ask a lot simple. Yeah, question just just no, no, just ask me two or three questions, <laughs> okay. and, and I'll just speak for the whole hour. No, okay. I'm kidding. Um, um, no, it's a great question. Um, there, in, there, but the the issue is that there are problems at many levels to to answer. One one problem uh, that this uh, is trying to address is the whole issue that there are communities, the whole disparities angle, that there are communities whose expression of illnesses doesn't quite conform to what some providers expect, or their explanations are off according to the providers, so that there's a lot of misdiagnosis uh, that we're trying wow. to help correct. So for example, there's an epidemic of misdiagnosis of psychosis among mm -hmm. certain communities, particularly um, famously, if you will, African American, especially men. Uh, they're just consistently, in study after study, here in the UK, all sorts of places, yeah. overdiagnosed as being schizophrenic when they're not. They may be 
having a, a you know a bipolar illness with some psychotic features, but they're not schizophrenic. They don't have schizophrenia, or they may just be, you know, concerned about their their you know the way they're being treated, and that's mm -hmm. being taken as paranoia. I mean, there's so many ways in which there there are misdiagnoses all over the place. One study that used a cultural formulation approach in in Canada found that of the 70 people who were referred to this consultation service for cultural evaluation, half of them, meaning of the 70 people who received a diagnosis of psychosis when they were sent to the consultation service, half of them were re-diagnosed as not having psychosis. Oh, my, that's, that's huge. Yeah, it's huge. I mean, that's huge. Yeah. Most of them were immigrants from places where there had been wars and they had PTSD with some features that reminded people of psychosis, or they might attribute their illness to something that felt uh, bizarre to the interviewer, like witchcraft or something like that, but which for them was just a way of speaking about their relations with their community or their family, but it wasn't that they thought. Right. Uh, you, well, know, you, know, one of the, you know, it's interesting you raised that issue is, um, and just this, this very quick story that, you know, you kind of remind me of, you know, I'm from Sicily. Mm -hmm. We were talking before, you feel Puerto Rico, I'm from Sicily. And um, if, if a family member was to say, you know, uh, grandma who died years ago uh, visited me last night. Right, right, exactly. And uh, told me that uh, I better not do certain mm -hmm. things because I'd get into trouble. Uh, we're not going to send, uh, we're not going to send her off with an ambulance to the quickest, right. like, in fact, some family members might say, listen, the next time she comes by, right. ask her where that ring was. Right, that exactly. Looking Reminder, for me. we're yeah, still... Where is it? Right. So it's kind of like right. that sort of like perspective. I mean, yes. it's much more... That's not a negative outcome, but the perception yes, yes. of unusual behavior or bizarre behavior, there's a cultural context to that, Yes. which is what, you know, yeah. and we can make a lot of mistakes. Yes. I think that's what, you know, a very important point for everyone out there. Like, why, why is this so important that we right. look at this? Is that you can make some, you can do harm. Yeah. Right? If you don't have a lens right. on, and as a core competency in many ways, to be able to engage someone to understand their experience from their framework, right, <coughs> then we can really cause some harm. I mean, yeah. that's, that's what one of the possibilities it seems to me. I agree completely. And, and, and to give another short example was a, a person that I saw in the emergency room once in psychiatry many years ago, who, because this one's an example a little bit of the structure in which the person worked and how that structure contributed to worse in her mm -hmm. situation was this was a Latino woman somewhere in Central America who was working at a hospital uh, cleaning as a cleaning person and fell, slipped and fell on the floor and hit the back of her head. And she became very concerned that maybe she had a, an injury that needed attention. And so she uh, wanted to have uh, an x-ray of the back of her head, but she was taken by the job to uh, uh, an emergency room mm -hmm. where they said essentially, We're, we've examined you, you don't need an x-ray. And she was very worried. So she kept insisting, no, I need an x-ray. I, I imagine there was all sorts of pressures at work, all sorts of reasons mm -hmm. why this was even worse than it sounds in some ways in this, in this account. And so when the person said that, that they insisted, no, no, you won't get an x-ray, your insurance doesn't cover it, you know, this kind of thing. So she went outside to the waiting area and was crying uh, that she hadn't gotten the care that she needed. And one of the people who work at the ER came out and said to her, stop crying, there's sick people here. And uh, she just lost it. She had one of these episodes of loss of control called a uh, nervous attack, ataque de nervios. In the emergency room, she was put in five-point restraints and sent to the emergency room where I was the doctor. And all it took at that moment was just asking her what had happened. Mm -hmm. She was, at that point, completely able to explain the whole situation, what her expectation was, why it wasn't met, what it was that she was afraid of, you know, permanent damage, all sorts of things, that people had had these accidents at work that hadn't been found, and, you know, so she was afraid. So all that, you just get that story. And she didn't need five-point restraints. She didn't need anything. She didn't need an emergency yeah. room in psychiatry. She needed an x-ray. Right. So we did an x-ray, and she was perfectly fine. fine. Yeah. So that, that's sort of like the critical piece, that all good clinical care, that one of the first tasks that we have, and that's true for everyone who's on this, I was listening to this right now, in the work that you do with your clients, uh, understanding their perspective mm -hmm. is like job one, mm -hmm. right? That's Before right. we share our perspective. Mm -hmm. but understand, and understanding the various identities individuals have and how their culture, religious, all the various things you had mentioned, shapes that 
understanding of whatever it is that they're going through. Mm -hmm. Because people label it, right? Mm -hmm. They define it. And if there's a misalignment between the client's perspective and the perspective of the practitioner, mm -hmm. and there isn't an effort to kind of have a really deep understanding, mm -hmm. uh, you can disengage. I mean, one of the mm -hmm. things I, I would think might be a disengagement yes. uh, of the client and poor treatment. Is that, yes. is that something that you that you find? Uh, definitely, uh, and, and definitely. And I would add to what you said, which I agree completely with, is that it's not only this understanding of each other, which is the part that the, uh, the CFI most emphasizes, but it's also understanding the context in which everybody's working, so that the person's place in society, their the the determinants that have led to the current situation, all of that are are things you know, housing, education, jobs. You know, all these are important elements of understanding what is behind the problem and what are the options the person has to solve them. So that, in addition to right. to all the interactional elements you're asking, and yes, to to answer your question. But one of the uh, reasons for doing this work was the disengagement that people had uh, with psychiatric care. I'm a psychiatrist, so I was treating people with medication. And the enormous concerns for depression, the enormous concerns that people had about taking medications for depression, when from the perspective of the psychiatrist, they weren't addictive, they weren't particularly dangerous anymore. Mm -hmm you know, even an overdose, many of these medicines anymore. So there were all these technical uh, attitudes that psychiatrists have that this is no big deal, but that are not shared, you know, right. by a lot of the population right. who are very concerned about taking medications, yes. and in some ways rightly so. But you have to engage the person, understand what they're thinking, instead of just telling them, no, no, just forget what you think, and you know, which is... And by the way, that's yeah. one pet peeve of mine. We, we psychiatrists in the mental health field, we end up distinguishing between what we call the patient's beliefs and we, we what we call our own knowledge or evidence. So it's like we don't have beliefs, psychiatrists, you know, we know. Whereas you have facts. We have facts. The science behind it. Yes, exactly. Whereas the, the, the patient just thinks they know. You know, whereas in fact they have bias, in other words. They, they just way. basically come Yeah, from that's bias, another right? way of saying it. I mean, you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't say, I believe the sun will rise in the morning. Right. You know, it's like, it's that level of certainty we think we have. Yeah. When, when the level of certainty is misplaced, I, we, our field isn't at the place where we know so much. Right. It, we, we have all sorts of evidence, and, and I mean, you should not listen to your doctor because there is such a thing as science and evidence and right. all that, but it isn't. It doesn't always trump what the person knows. The person often is more knowledgeable on their experience in life than, right. than the doctor. Well, you, you said it's very much, a, when I hear you s described in this way, it sounds very much like a, taking a shared decision making. Yes, kind it of is. Approach very to much. It, is that, you know, uh, it's not just about me having the right answer and then how do I get this person to do it? Right. Which can be that kind of an approach. Right. Very well meaning. Yes. I, I no, say, I get it. Is, uh, is the idea that I need to have a shared understanding. Uh, and understand that person's perspective. And around medication is interesting. We were doing some work on wellness self-management and we were doing a videotape of a particular class. And the, and the class and the wellness self-management curriculum was on medication. And a woman from Puerto Rico actually had said, you know, uh, one of the things about medication, if you're kind of like weird or kind of, uh, that's yeah. like okay. Yeah, you yeah, know, we just yeah, say, yeah. you know, uncle so-and-so or cousin is a little right. bit off, but you get invited to all the events right. and so like, and the, the way in which you know the person really has a bona fide mental illness is if they take medication. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So it was sort of like, wow, yeah. not understanding that, right? Yeah. Where a person's reluctance or concerns or worries about just the treatment around medication, yes. not understanding their perspective on the meaning that it has, right. is you can find yourself in this tug of war that's not going to really work. And I think that's a, a, an area that you, you know, like an example of failing to understand the cultural perspective leads us into a, either disagreements and misalignment and perhaps, uh, you know, people having to lie to right. you because they right. don't want to tell you if they don't think that you're going to be understanding and accepting of that. So it, there's a lot of issues here. And the CFI was a tool that you and others said, look, let's try to contribute to the field because this is complex, right? right it isn't right. like, let's just do a webinar right. <laughs> and take these things you ought to ask, but rather provide some real resource. Can you tell us a little bit about that, that tool and how folks might be able to, you know, what's in it really? And, sure. and, 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 uh, and if people were interested in learning more, 
what they might be able to do. Sure, um, happy to. Um, the cultural formulation interview is uh, essentially a three components, three components, all of which are uh, protocols of questions. So they're mm -hmm. they're guides for how to conduct an interview. They're, they're not questionnaires in the sense that you fill them out yes, no, like okay. that. They're open-ended questions in a in a list, basically in a structure that guide an interview. So for example, the main component we call the core CFI has 16 questions. Mm -hmm. Some have sub questions, but okay. there are 16 general topics, 16 questions in four domains. And they are asked of an individual person, like a, a provider. So if you're doing an interview with yeah, me, yeah. what would be one of the right. first questions? Exactly. So one of so it's exactly. So it's designed actually to start an interview. That's how we like it to be done, mm -hmm. because that way we get the person's perspective first, as opposed to starting with our own preoccupations and closed-ended questions about what's going on. And the first question is actually designed to fit the kind of first questions everybody asks, like, what brings you here today? That's <laughs> right. essentially the first right. question, a version right. of that. But from there, it, the first three questions are the first domain, and they go to try to understand what the person thinks is going on, how they make sense of what's happening, how do they call it even. So one is a general question, what's going on, and then there's a probe that says, you know, there are many ways of answering that question. And you, we doctors and patients, you know, clients don't need to agree. You could think it's this, you could think it's that. Right. So the, if, there's, if we need more information as to what we mean, there's a probe. Then the second question is different, because that first question is like any question right. any, any mental provider would ask. The, the second question is different than most providers would ask. And that asks, how would you describe this problem of yours, this situation? to somebody in your community, to your family, your friends, or somebody you, you wouldn't know, tell. You know what I love about that? Mm -hmm. no, I've been, I've been a, I was a clinician for like 16 years. I never asked that question. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's an no, unusual question. No, what I like about it, it's an unusual question. Right. But now that I think about it, mm -hmm. I said, you know, that would be a great question mm -hmm. for me to have an insight and understanding of how this person's how they attach meaning yes. to whatever they're going through. Yes. It's how you would explain it. To, to, to your family, grandmother, to your grandmother, grandmother or something yeah, like yeah, that, right, so right, what's right. going on. Yeah. That is like a really great question. Yeah, thank you. We, we worked hard on it. Oh, good. Yeah, that was what somebody else suggested. It wasn't my idea, but it was, <laughs> but it was a great idea. The, because we're hoping that, um, that what we're doing there is expanding the realm of what is uh, data. For, for the provider and for the person. So that we're saying, we don't, we're not only just interested in you telling me I've got schizophrenia, you know, because you're repeating, right. you've been here before, you know what they want, what we want to hear. Exactly. We're saying, okay, first we say, you know, there are many ways of answering the first question. Then we say, okay, we realize you may be telling us some things because it's not like you're lying. You, you, that's how you explain it to right. us because we may be limited <laughs> in our understanding of your situation. But how would you explain it to other people? Basically, and so sometimes it's, oh, I tell them it's uh, depression too, you know, and okay, so you have a sense. Or they say, no, I, my grandmother thinks it's X, Y, and Z, and mm -hmm. I, so that's how I discuss it with you. The third question is all part of that first domain about what's, what is this, and the third question is, what is it that troubles you the most about? Because we want to get to the thing that is most bothersome to them, as opposed to I'm treating some di some label instead of why the person right. came in. Right. And sometimes that happens a lot where we, the person walks in and I decide they're depressed and I decide depression is the most important thing that they're suffering from where in fact they might be there to, you know, for some problem with their family or a job or some problem with the boss or some reason, a lack of money, you know, all sorts of reasons that sure it's connected to the depression, but that's not right. why they're there. Right. You know, and out of those first three questions, we get a, a phrase. The, the the provider is asked to come up with an with a uh, like a summary like a, yeah but you, you just a few words, words that is what we're going to plug into the rest of the interview where it says problem because the next question is what do you think causes your problem and there you put in you know what is it your causes you the you know you're concerned that everybody thinks you're uh, not telling the truth you know about your experience or what is it that bothers you know what causes the fact that you've had this big argument with your family and now you can't get back together. You know, whatever it is that right. they said their major right. problem was. Right. You know, that's what we focus the rest of the question. So it's, it's focused on what the person has said right. is the problem. And of course, as you go along, you may decide you had it wrong and that 
as they explain further, they may decide, you know, the right. person may decide, well, actually, I thought I was here for X, but I'm really here for Y. Right. So you then shift. There's always the possibility for you to refine that phrase. Right. But you, we want you to use the patient's language. Well, you know what's really interesting? I'm trying to think of what's the experience of a client in this process? Mm -hmm. And what comes to mind for me is I'd say, gee, this psychiatrist or social worker or psychologist or therapist really seems to care a lot mm -hmm, mm -hmm. about what's going on with me and how I see things, mm -hmm. you know, rather than being this kind of like, mm -hmm. I'm a passive contributor, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, you're asking about what might, am I have this symptom, that symptom, right, that symptom, right. right? Going off a checklist so I can give you a diagnosis. But rather, it's that engagement in, of that person in valuing their their lives, they're valuing their experience, valuing the meaning, valuing what's most urgent mm -hmm. for them in their lives. I mean, that's what's coming across to me. Yeah, that's what that's we so, intend. Yeah, that, that intention. And I think that that is an incredibly important message mm -hmm. for any practitioner out there. And I, I know some of the folks who are listening to this, uh, if you do find an opportunity in the work, like your client, you're going to see at 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock, uh, and you have not asked some of these questions in this way, mm -hmm. um, and this is just giving you a little sample because the CFI has other questions, mm -hmm. right, to, mm -hmm. to really fill this, this, this kind of diagnostic process, but from the client's sort of like perspective, right. uh, that you can use that, that would be, a, I think, a, a really a, one possible benefit of being on this, uh, you know, being on this particular conversations with Dr. Tony and listening to the insights really from uh, Dr. Lewis um, so that's, I think, an area which I like so much about it because it's such a strong engagement process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and as you mentioned, it's so important because we can make so many mistakes mm -hmm. when we are basically filtering all these things through our own kind of like lens mm -hmm. as opposed to giving that person the opportunity. But it's more than the, being diagnostic. It's also uh, engaging that mm -hmm. person in a way that I respect your experience so much. Mm -hmm. And it's, I'm going to guide my work. Mm -hmm. and my treatment based upon your experience right. rather than shaping you yeah. to go along with my, my experience, what, my yeah, what I think be. my treatment should be, you know. <laughs> so that I think is like really very, very, uh, very important. Um, so we've just about, um, you know, our, our conversations with Dr. Tony usually is a 30 minutes. Uh, to have